age related or future of work investments uh, and uh, our fund invests on behalf of Comcast and Universal and NBC but we behave exactly like an independent fund think of us much more like a Google Ventures than a strategic fund. I'll give my quick overview. I'm Claire Fokian at Highland. Um, we're a 33 year old fund with offices in Boston, New York, San Francisco, and Palo Alto. Um, I'm currently in New York. Um, we do Series A and B investing all across the gamut, um, about 50 50 consumer and enterprise, um, with initial checks somewhere between five and 20 million. I think we're the only investors. Um, you guys want to just. I think that's right start hitting us with questions. I have um, the spreadsheet up that like shows what everyone's doing. So that's been helpful. So I have context, but I don't know, feel free to jump in. <laughs> I guess one question I've had, so we're early stage uh, and I've been talking to more seed stage funds, but it seems like everyone's, there's a ton of people who've raised like 25 million, $50 million fund. Um, what's gonna happen? I mean seems like it's been really easy to raise a fund basically, but what's gonna happen to that whole level? Because early stage is harder. There just aren't as many funds writing 250K, 500K checks and leading a, you know, a smaller round. Um, so yeah, what do you guys think is gonna happen at that end of the market? It's a really good question. I think that, um, I think that market's gonna dry up, but I don't think it's gonna happen for probably a couple of years. I think that, um, it's definitely worth thinking about, I think as a founder, when you're looking at funds, what the composition of the LP mix is. And it's a super like unsexy topic to think about, but I think unless a fund has a mix of illiquid funds uh, or high net worths who are sort of dabbling their toes in venture, I think commitments will probably continue for a little bit. Um, I think the funds start running into trouble when they start raising their second or third funds and they either don't have a returns profile or just assets dry up in the asset class because that's happening across the economy. Um, so I, I think at least at seed and pre-seed, those like 200K checks will persist for a little bit longer. I think it might just mean that across the industry, people are tightening their lens because they sort of can't mess up their returns. And so maybe go for things that are less moonshot, but sort of less downside too. And just like a quick poll, I assume everyone here is sort of like around seed stage, pre-series A. Yep. I see heads nodding, that's super helpful. I used to be at a seed fund, so I'll like put that hat back on for this conversation. Uh, I'll add my thoughts, Eric. I think, um, I actually think the seed stage fund is gonna be pretty healthy compared to the rest of the capital ladder. I think, I think pre-seed companies will be thought of in much the same manner that they were before. And given that revenue probably isn't arriving soon, I think that you can have a very similar conversation to the one that would have hit previously. I think the interesting consideration is if you think the fund may be vulnerable for not raising another fund, what happens to follow on financing for your, for your business. So actually, I, I think the, the near term problem of can I have enough good conversations with funds that have raised capital, I think that's probably less of a challenge than, than maybe the premise of the question. I think the interesting question is, okay, how do I, how do I talk to a quality fund that is going to be around no matter what? Or how do I get insight into the nature of the fund that means that you know, in five years time or three years time, when I need that fund to stand by me and support me, I, I know it's gonna be there and paying attention to me. It's actually kind of a good point too. I think probably now more than ever, it's important to think about the partner or the individual that's investing on top of the fund as well, because if the fund does disappear or starts to have to choose and fight fires with other portfolio companies, you want someone who's incredibly invested in you, I think, and is going to be helpful long term. But I don't know how that'll play out. It's just interesting food for thought, I think. That's a, that's a real. I mean, you're in. You know, it's like a, you're in your own pod, right? And who else is in that pod with you matters. Right. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so because I'm sort of trying to think about those investors that 
Eric's yeah. example that are writing 200 or 300 K. You know, there's a really wide range of people that are putting out a lot of capital who could disappear, but there's also a lot of people that are, you know, trying to get funds off the ground and for economic reasons, couldn't get a second fund going, but might be the most helpful person on your cap table because they have a ton of heart and, and, you know, a lot of um, invested interest in your company. Yeah, there's definitely a human dimension to this. I mean, the, the other one is, and Eric, I don't know if you would agree with this or seeing the same evidence, but I, I don't know if you guys are aware or not, but the, there's been a ton of capital inflow into the venture business recently. And as Eric alluded to, lots of funds starting up, particularly at around that 25 to $50 million range. Uh, I think actually for funds that have just been formed, it's advantageous for them because they're just walking into a scenario where valuations will almost certainly adapt. Companies will require capital. I think there could be some all time great fund vintages or funds formed at the moment that, um, that work very well for the business. Uh, I think, and it's, this is, there's some subtlety here. I think, I think looking at funds that have invested for the past two years, let's say, at probably the height of valuations and you're going to be the last investment made out of that fund and the fund partners don't have strong individual reputations from which to draw upon that's probably a higher risk profile than uh, than a newbie fund which is just starting to raise and will probably by luck as much as anything stumble into a vintage that will probably be pretty good yeah, i would say that's accurate the funds uh, i've touched base with a couple of people and the funds that are like halfway through um, are just going back to their portfolio. They're actually not even looking for new yet. Um, mm. But yeah, the new funds, I mean, they're good for five years. So they'll be able to, yeah, they'll be able to ride the, get the better valuations now, um, and potentially get better returns. Yeah. I was just talking to a fund that just did their first close, a Series A fund. They probably did their first close in like February. Um, and we were just chatting last week. And they've done, I think, one deal so far. And they were like, we just want to get a couple really straight down the fairway deals in the portfolio so that we can sort of establish ourselves as putting capital out, but not take sort of risky bets right now. And I think that's probably sort of the sentiment with some of these newer funds, which are looking to not necessarily take huge risks right now or huge swings, because we don't even know what sort of this new environment looks like yet, um, but still want to put capital out. Why, why, why do you think they'd want to put capital out versus hold it until things become a little clearer? Just to the worst right. thing, the worst thing to have in your fund is to sit on investor capital for a year and then give them the opportunity it's to reputation because you're not investing. Right. They want, they want to know what you're buying. So it's easy, it's easier if you have, you know, half your capital deployed and you have a portfolio and you can say, this is where our attention's going and this is what you've bought so far. And, you know, you can sort of follow along if you're sending out quarterly updates with nothing on them for a year. My guess is a lot of those LPs would start to pull out because they want to put capital to work. There is probably a halfway house there where I think if I was raising, if I was running a fund that had just had my first close, I probably wouldn't rush to deploy for two months, mm -hmm. maybe even three months, while I just waited for the environment to settle out. I think the information raises a ton over the next 90 days. And then I think I'd be in good position. I'd, I'd work hard. I'd, uh, I'd try to figure out what the landscape was looking like. And, and then I'd look to deploy. So we may, we may see some, some paused activities over the next 60 to 90 days. Mm -hmm. you, guys, are you guys paused over the next 60 to 90 days or what's your view not being a new fund? Was that to me, Claire? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, as I, as I said on the, uh, and the and the main that there's a little bit of subtlety so we've done a ton of deals recently we've just closed six deals um and there's a ton of new deal activity w w what is not yet completely resolved in our fund is can we get all the way through to completion without ever having met the entrepreneur in person and that is a question that i think some partners will fall one side of the line and some partners will fall the other, other side of the line and I also think going early is much easier in that decision. So um, pre-seed and seed stage companies, even though the team is such an important part of that bet, the check size is manageable 
And I think the partnership could get comfortable writing, in effect, what is a smaller check for the fund into those kind of investments. What I think is going to be difficult for the next two months, let's say, and I would cause a kind of pause period is, I think it's going to be difficult to write a big check into a company that you didn't know before. So an entrepreneur that you didn't know before. I think you could get there for an entrepreneur that you've spent time with and that you know how they operate. But I think kind of de novo relationships are going to be, for large checks, are going to be difficult. Do you guys feel that, uh, you know, one way to manage those risks is just to make smaller bets and make more of them? Mm, that's right. Yeah, I think, um, I think that will happen. We're being relatively aggressive about, about seed investments. Um, I was on a, I'm on the investment committee for our, for our enterprise investments on the East Coast. We just, we just pitched one yesterday or um, got one pitched to me yesterday. I, I, think we, I think we do that. And I think that's, I think that's right. So I still think you'll see activity. Um, but I think, I think for the next 60 days, the bar will be higher. And that next 60 days is just figuring out where we are. I mean, there's such uncertainty around both the health aspects and the reopening of the economy aspects. I just think we'll know a lot more in 60 days. And that's probably a good thing for both sides. I mean, that's what we've been telling companies that we're meeting with as well is, look, you guys probably want to hang out 60 days as well, because you'll, you'll learn a ton more in, in 60 days rather than raising now, in which you know, you'll be subject to a ton of uncertainty. We're probably sort of in line with that, although we don't do seed investments. We don't do check sizes larger than 5 million. And I think we'd stick to that just because that's our model. And we're, we're really fortunate in the sense that because we're a 33 year old fund, we have really patient long-term capital and we're about half deployed in our most recent fund. So we have the patience and time to be able to watch what happens with the market. And I'm on the same page as Andrew in that I keep reminding myself and everybody else that it feels like we've been working from home from an eternity, but it's it's really pretty recent and we can't even begin to forecast what the quote unquote new normal looks like because we just don't even know where we are. We're a month into this thing. Um, so there's no harm in, in being a little bit patient. I also think that from a company perspective, it's a little bit tough right now, especially at our stage at A and B, which is a little bit different than seed because there's a little bit more flexibility and in fluidity and spend. But I'm seeing a lot of founders um, that I've been watching for six months or so waiting for the right time to invest and I'll reach out to them for catch-ups and they sort of don't want to catch up with VCs because I think some of the best companies, their insiders are funding um, and doing sort of bridge rounds for the next six months to get them through for this exact reason. So they just don't know what's going to happen for the next six months and just, you know, don't want to have to think about raising in the next six months. Um, or the ones that are raising right now tend to be the ones that sort of can't find capital from insiders. And again, that's not necessarily happening at seed, but I think smart founders are thinking the same way in that, you know, unless you have incredible fundamentals and incredible capital efficiencies, you're willing to take, you know, maybe a compromised multiple or something, or there's an incredible need for capital. It kind of makes sense to wait 60 days just to see what happens. Yeah. Agreed. How about you guys? I'd love to hear from you guys. Have you seen a big change in sentiment from investors? Have you seen them, you know, drop meetings or say, look, we're, we're shut for business or signal in any particular direction? Uh, yeah. I mean, um, in my company, we're in the, in the real estate space and uh, all of our investors are strategics uh, that are in this space. Uh, mm -hmm. It's great for us because they act as kind of a sales force for us. But those guys are, you know, are really busy right now. If you're an attorney, yeah. if you're in a title business, uh, if you're a mortgage in mortgage, I mean, these guys are all uh, experiencing deep distress in different ways. Either they're they're just incredibly busy, um, or they're seeing, uh, you know, they're, they're especially the attorneys, uh, just seeing, you know, their business drop off uh, to you know very large percentages. So. We did get a couple of checks uh, right when things started to fall apart, uh, which kind of led me to my question because the size of those 
those checks uh, were you know, half at best of what they were going to do. Uh, but those who were committed still went through with it. Um, at, but the check sizes were much smaller. The ones who, who um, didn't cross the line in time kind of dropped off. Yeah. I don't know what other people's experiences are, but the capital what? that we got, sorry? Now I was going to say, when you said that you got a couple checks, are those from insiders or from new investors? New investors, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, with those kinds of investors, um, you know, it's, it's uh, what do you call it, the circles of trust. So there are extensions of the people that were already on the inside. Um, but kind of, you know, thinking about the next raises when you followed that kind of strategic strategy, uh, you know, all of those people are going to be under tremendous stress for, for months to come. I'm, I'm reluctant to even, you know, reach out to them at this moment because they're so busy working from home with their kids screaming in the background. How about others' experiences? Vivian? I uh, kicked off fundraising um, middle of February, and as an East Coaster, it took me, you know, three weeks just to get in front of people on the West Coast and to, you know, line up those meetings. Um, and I flew back to New York the first week of March. Um, and, you know, since then have had a couple of meetings over Zoom, and I find them to be a lot slower. Um, However, because I'm in the future of workspace, um, we've seen incredible growth. So I am still having meetings with investors and there is a lot more um, even cold investors reaching out to me from you know, the first batch of outreach that I did. Um, however, one thing that I'm realizing now is that um, angels you know, are definitely, um, well, you know, they're, <laughs> they're nowhere to be found and they're very much silent now. Um, one of the things that I've been told again, time and time again is, you know, you have to create FOMO, you have to have a timeline, you know, um, and it feels a lot harder to create that when you can't have that face-to-face -face, um, report with people. Um, and, you know, people can take their time to, you know, try to schedule the next meeting and then want to dig in more information because like you said, it's uh, beneficial for the investors to just, you know, see what happens after 60 days. Um, and as a company that, you know, is seeing a surge in user base because we're in the remote workspace, um, 60 days is a long time. Um, so I'm kind of simultaneously juggling, you know, do I buckle down and, you know, go hard after investors or do I right now just focus on, um, capturing the users as much as I can because, you know, the time is here and now. Yeah, makes sense. It's difficult judgment. I mean, uh, I guess, I guess one piece of advice would be, I suspect that at least some investors are taking meetings and slow rolling next meetings just because they want to get to a period at which they have clarity on the future and kind of have the green light on we're now ready to deploy you should ask them that question directly. Say, look, what, what's the timeline? And institutionally, are you guys ready to deploy capital in the next you know, six weeks or so? I think that would flush out some interesting answers. Yeah, I think then, Charlie mentioned that like the next best thing is like a quick no. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah. But Vivian, also, if you want to shoot me your deck, I have an active angel fund that I invest out of and some friends I do some angel investing with, and we've written two checks in the last month. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Um, and then my other question is, you know, originally I set out to raise 2 million because, you know, that felt like a good number in good times. Um, and I don't know if that's realistic anymore. And obviously the advice is to do something that's realistic um, and get, you know, close it as quickly as possible. Um, do I lower that amount now, even though I've already had conversations with people saying I'm raising two, do I lower it to 1 million because that's much more achievable or like somewhere in between like 1.5? I always think this question, sorry, Andrew, if you want to go ahead, feel free. No, no, I was just saying, please go. <laughs> I always think this question is kind of interesting. And I think that you ultimately need to be the one to make the decision because it's your business and you know it better than we do. I don't want to lead you to an answer. I would say there's a lot of different factors right now. The first thing you mentioned about lowering the amount 
even though you've already mentioned raising 2 million, I think you sort of get a bit of a free pass right now because this is, you know, the world's kind of on fire to a certain degree. I don't think you get horribly penalized for, you know, not building that FOMO right now just because it's kind of understandable. People aren't writing checks. So I, I wouldn't worry about that if you feel that 1 million is the right move. I think the things to consider are um, the time because I think that it could ostensibly take, you know, 2x, 3x, whatever it is longer to actually raise. And you mentioned being able to focus completely on the business right now. Um, I think it depends what you can do with a million and a million and a half versus 2 million. And you have to sort of weigh the calculus there and, and decide what's best for the business. Um, if there is an option to delay outright for three months and raise in three months when things are a little bit more certain, and that feels like the right decision for the business, I think that is totally fine too. And I think it's fine to come back to that entire list of investors in three months and say, we hit pause and here we are again, because I think, again, you sort of don't get penalized for that FOMO kind of stuff now. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's kind of a, a non-direct response, if that makes sense. Yeah. I will say on the angel side, um, we are, so we'll probably end up with about 250 to 500, um, but we're able to do that right now. So I started those conversations two weeks ago, but we're able to do that some from existing investors. Um, this is all angels. Um, but because we're applying to this million dollar Air Force contract on April 30th, and we need investors to come in to give us a better chance of getting the million. Uh, and so, I mean, that's how we created the sense of urgency is like, we need this commitment by April 30th, because then we can get a million dollars non-dilutive. All we need you to do is sign a term sheet. We don't even need them to get the money. So half of the angels um, are just like, fuck off, go away, I'm busy. And the other half are like, yeah, I'm looking for deals. So I think with, I mean, it's, it's good terms. Like it's not the terms that we would love as founders, but if we can get another million non-dilutive on top of it, it makes sense. Um, so it works for both sides. Yeah, so people are talking or not talking at all, but yeah, there are people looking for deals. Yeah, I think, um... Vivian, the other interesting thing that you have going on is that your business is flourishing right now in this time, right? And so I think there are investors that are investing and it's happening much more at the pre-seed and seed stage because yeah. the willingness to, to write checks without having you know, multiple meetings in person is much higher. Um, and so if there is a way you can sort of use this period right now to form a really compelling narrative, um, I think you can use it. I think what gets coupled with that though, that people will be focusing on, given that the bar is just that much higher, is capital efficiency will this raise last you through probably 18 to 24 months instead of you know nine to 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a much bigger focus on unit economics and potential profitability baked into your projections or at least the way that you operate the business and how you allocate those resources. So a lot more of a focus on sort of use of funds and, and the sort of why now. Yeah. But I think you have the story of now is the time to raise because we wanna you know press the gas pedal and we think that this revenue will be sticky, which is really important. It's not sort of a flash in the pan right now. Um, and there's capital out there for that type of story. I think it goes back to Andrew's point again, of just finding the quick nose as well so that you can stay focused. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I would do if I were you is, I mean, it depends on if you need the money right away or not too. That's the other factor. But if you can build that story and go out and get 500 to a million right now and do that in three or four weeks and then just execute, like how much farther ahead are you than waiting three months and then seeing where you are? So that's kind of, um, so my product right now is we're operating off of an MVP, which is breaking apart. Um, our traffic March versus February grew by like 48% and then versus December when nobody was looking for jobs grew by like 417%. So this product was never built for, you know, this amount of usage. Um, so one of the things that, you know, I'm trying to juggle is do I, uh, you know, hunker down, get the capital and build the next version of the product, which is, you know, much earlier than I anticipate it. Or do I focus on, you know, engaging and maintaining the users because people are flocking to my platform and, you know, it's not the best user experience right now because it's, it's breaking. So like keep them happy. Um, but at the same time, it's two competing priorities and it's really hard to decide which one to focus on. I kind of split my day now into Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say, I, I think one of the strategies that um, entrepreneurs don't often appreciate is uh, if you take less now at a lower valuation, that pushes you out to milestones that are greater 
then um, that allows you to raise the milestones that are uh, uh, more significant than you have in front of you now. The, the, the dilution to the founders over those two rounds of financing often looks identical. I, I don't know if I was clear enough there, but if you raise one big round of financing now is relatively dilutive and in anticipation of another one down the line, taking a smaller raise now at a lower valuation that lets you get further and then raises and allows you to raise an even bigger round the next time around. The, those two paths of dilution often look very similar. And I find entrepreneurs often overly focused on the dilution effects of this immediate round without taking into account the additional runway and the additional milestones that can be achieved by taking a smaller round now that tees you up for an even bigger round next time. Next time. And so if you, if you want to think through that and maybe give yourself permission to take a smaller round now more immediately that gets you further, that might be, that might get you more comfortable with that kind of alternative strategy. And the second piece of advice is I, I would, um, I focus on getting the capital in in relatively near terms because I think if you keep your users happy, it sounds like there's natural kind of product market fit. I think you'll very rapidly find yourself um, in a position where it is again starting to break apart. So I, I would get the capital in, just remediate the platform now, get it scaled, get it up and running, and that'll give you some some relief as you as you as you scale. Because I think if you just try and firefight on on current assets, you'll very quickly run into the same problem. Yeah. Thank you. Good advice. Any others, Alex, Caitlin? Yeah, I got I'll jump in. Um, so yeah, we. Uh, so we're a little bit of a different situation because we uh, started a business in 2014 um, called Social Rank, and we sold it end of last year. Um, it was like a social media analytics product, and um, we sold it for some cash, all cash, at close in December. So we used that as runway, um, and we we were going to go out for some money, but then we I'm 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 personally convinced that the only the only two, there's only two types of deals that are going to happen right now. One is you either know them already, like you've known someone who went to college with them, you've known them for years, or they or a repeat founder, or there's like some sort of traction that is off the charts. Um, I think just like taking that bet, even at the seed stage, that's going to really change right now. I think um, like I mean, traction could be like there's a lot of usage. It could be they have like revenue. It, it could mean a bunch of things. Traction is like a made up word. But um, that's my personal, I also think we're only in the first inning on this thing. I think, I don't know if anyone saw, but Facebook just announced that there's no travel uh, or no gatherings uh, until June, 2021 for the whole company. Um, so I think we're uh, in the first inning and um, cash is gonna be king for the next year, year and a half. So yeah, it's gonna be, I, <laughs> I, I don't know if anyone else saw that, I was just, I saw it while I was listening to the panel before. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, for us, we're just like, cut all expenses, um, become cockroaches and just survive. Yeah, I think as a principle, that's, that's, uh, that makes a lot of sense. I think we're relatively pessimistic about economic recovery and we've been advising all of our companies to buy hook or buy crook and it doesn't have to be through, through rifts try and get to 18 months of runway because 18 months of runway, we should be able to see some, some recovery. Or I think even like we'll have more data to figure out what we're all working towards and what environment we're living in. I would love to know, um, you know, what, um, obviously it's really hard to predict the future, but just kind of based on what we've seen even in the last, like, you know, 30 days, um, what do you guys think will happen um, in the future when it comes to work, when it comes to even like, you know, remote work? Um, fundamentally, how do you think we're going to shift as a society? Maybe I'll, I'll take that. I, I actually have a, it's one of the areas that I'm interested in. I, I have a I have a long-term view of this, which is, I think 
enterprises are capturing so much more data and uh, the application machine learning for that data is starting to tee up the ability to uh, map work processes. So enterprises get stuff done or any business gets stuff done by humans doing something and then a machine system doing something and handing back to a human and handing back to a machine system. That's a typical kind of um, workflow. And I think, I think enterprises will start to map how they create value. I think that has a whole set of secondary effects for how do you mechanize the enterprise? How do you bring in labor? I think labor will get much more fractionalized. I think we'll see much more offshore labor. And these remote tools play into that. I think that will be a decade long shift, but I think there will be a whole set of very significant economic consequences that will actually have been shortened by this particular crisis because it will show everybody that Zoom working and remote working and project management actually has been very functional in ways that at least institutionally weren't believed before. Looks like we're getting kicked back to the main session. So uh, I'll see Thanks, you all in the room. Thank you. Thanks everyone Thank for you. questions. Thanks everyone.